Um, we are going to continue on in our study of Acts chapter 9, and I want to invite you to look at this passage of Scripture with me. You'll notice the title of the message is The Gospel to the Pharisee. We've been looking at the way in which the gospel is moving. And that's been the theme that we've been trying to look at the book of Acts with, the movement of the gospel, how it uh, starts there in uh, the temple courts at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes on the believers in Acts chapter 2, and then as it begins to spread, it begins to move through the preaching of Peter, uh, through the healing of people, uh, uh, of of a lame man in Acts chapter 3, then this this uh, response of people who are coming to know Jesus Christ. Then we see the gospel beginning to move to new places, places like Samaria, places like Ethiopia. And so we're watching the gospel move into places where you would not expect the gospel to move. That's, that's what I want you to see. This is an unexpected reality that we are watching. And so to watch the gospel move into the heart of a Pharisee should be completely jarring to you. Now, all of the study that we have done and all of the years that we've talked about Pharisees, they have gotten a reputation, rightfully so, as a people who are more concerned oftentimes with law than they are with grace, as a people who lay a heavy burden on the people. And of course, in this story, as we've been unpacking it, we've learned to come across this man by the name of Saul. He's shown up in a couple of small places so far. But the gospel uh, of Acts, as the, as the gospel moves through the book of Acts, we're going to see a transition uh, that will note that Saul becomes the primary character in the second half or the second two thirds of the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, I want you to listen as I read from Acts chapter 9. You can follow along uh, on the scriptures as you have them in front of you. If you have a pew Bible, you'll find this text on page 917. I invite you to look at it um, because sometimes you like to hear, sometimes you need to see, and I just want this to kind of soak over you. So follow along as I read the first 22 verses of chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who were belonging to the way, which is a great early church description of followers of Jesus, simply known as the way, unfortunately, that name has been commandeered by a cult today, Um, so we don't any longer call ourselves the way, but this is how it was described early in Acts chapter uh, 9, when the the first church was getting started, they were followers of the way, they were men or women that he wanted to bring bound to Jerusalem, verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached the city of Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter into the city and you will be told there what to do. So the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, for they heard the voice, but they saw no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate or drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias... And Ananias said, here I am. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he's seen a vision of a man named Ananias. So come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, uh, I've heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all those who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, The Lord Jesus 
uh, excuse me, who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and then he rose and he was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. This is a familiar passage, probably, to many of you. Uh, It's probably a, a story that you have heard and read because the person who is being confronted by the risen Savior in the story goes on to write so much of the New Testament. Of course, the Apostle Paul, we see him here in this passage named Saul. That's his Hebrew name. He later takes his Roman name, Paul. And so as I go throughout this message this morning, if I say Saul or Paul, I mean the same person. So you'll, you'll just grant me that, uh, that permission to use both names in reference here. In this passage, he's known strictly as Saul, and he's known as a Pharisee. He's known as someone who is doing the persecuting of the area. There's a question that um, weighs heavily sometimes in the air. It's simply this, how are you? Do you like that question or do you not like that question? I, I, I made a point this morning to not ask people, how are you? At least in my head, I made a point to not do that. But the reality was, as I probably said it four or five different times, because it naturally just kind of falls out of my mouth when I greet people. And we were talking as, as a pastoral staff this last week, and we were, we were talking about mental health issues and, and sometimes how this question can be a very difficult question for people to answer. Because oftentimes the person asking it doesn't really want to know the answer. And oftentimes the person who's receiving that question doesn't really want to give the answer. And so how are you weighs like this heavy weight sometimes where I don't really know what I should do with it. The question, how are you, is a question of being. What is your state of mind? It's actually a really deep question, and we just kind of toss it out there. Hey, how are you? Okay, I was just getting ready to tell you all this stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, good. I'll talk to you later. There's another question that's really deep, and you just take one letter and you move it to the front. Who are you? Who are you is also an incredibly deep question. It's a question not of being. It's a question of identity. Who are you? How do you identify? What are you known for? See, this question of identity has become really polarizing in our day. We like to have a label And try to answer this question, who are you? And if someone were to ask you the question, who are you, how would you consider answering it? You might answer it on the basis of your title. I'm a manager. I'm a supervisor. I'm the principal. I'm a doctor. So it might be something associated with a title. It might be something associated with a degree that you have earned or an honor that you have gained, an accomplishment. I'm a varsity athlete. I'm a salesperson of the year. I'm a mom. I'm a daughter. We have all these different categories by which we answer this question, who are you? Maybe you're tempted to answer this question according to gender and or attraction. This is very popular in our day. I'm male, I'm female, I'm non-binary, I'm gay, I'm straight, I'm bisexual. I have all these different labels by which I identify who I am. And so many people are looking for a way to demonstrate their identity. I'm married, I'm single. Sometimes it's a political identification. I'm Green Party, I'm independent, I'm Democrat, I'm Republican, I'm whatever. And you fill in the blanks, and this becomes your identity. 
my heritage. I'm French. I'm Japanese. I'm black, indigenous, person of color, or use that acronym. These are deep, deep identifiers that we find to try to make sense of how we fit in the world. Do you do that? Do you try to answer this question with a label of sorts? Have you found yourself using one of these titles, one of these accomplishments, one of these things to demonstrate who you are? You see, Paul saw in this passage introduces this identity in his own life, where in Acts chapter 9, we learn that he is a man who knows who his identity is and is willing to articulate it as such. I think if you were to ask Saul, who are you? He would say something like, I am a law-abiding Jewish Pharisee who is a student of Gamaliel. In fact, if you go through the book of Acts, if you go through some of the Pauline letters that he writes later in his life, those are often some of the things that he used to identify himself before this encounter with Jesus. He identified himself as a Jew. His heritage was very important to him. In fact, he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. He wants people to know specifically which clan he is a part of. He is a Pharisee. This is his political and religious affiliation within the camp. This is an identifier. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I studied at the feet of Gamaliel. I gained a degree in studying at his feet. Paul's identity before coming to faith in Jesus Christ, before this encounter on the road to Damascus, his identity was bound up in his cultural, religious, political heritage. Do you find yourself identifying in similar ways? Don't shake your head and no. Yes, you do. (laughs) You bind yourself up according to politics, according to accomplishment, according to heritage, according to gender. And I'm not saying that those things are wrong in and of themselves. What I am saying is that they are not the core of who you are. And what's happening in Acts chapter 9 is that Paul is having an identity crisis. Maybe you have as well, trying to figure out who am I and how do I fit into this world. You see, the interesting thing about identity is that identity often leads to purpose. If I know who I am or who I think I am, then I will act in a particular way that follows who I am. Does that make sense? If I identify as this, then my actions must do this. If I identify in a political party, then I must think this direction. If I identify in a particular gender, then I respond in this way. If I identify by an attraction, then I move according to the way that I'm attracted. If I identify by my accomplishments, then I move in that stream. Does that make sense? Your purpose in life oftentimes follows your identity. Yes? You're here? I trust you are. You're purpose in life follows your identity. So for Paul to say, I'm a Jewish Pharisee, law-abiding, Torah-following, follower of the Old Testament law, student of Gamaliel, this is my core identity, therefore, here is what I must do. I must extinguish the way. I must extinguish the people of Jesus who are identifying with him because they are a threat to my identity. See that? Paul is acting as a persecutor of the early church in line with who he sees himself to be. His actions are consistent with how he has identified Because this is who I am, therefore, this is what I must do. I identify as this, therefore, I do this. And you and I do the same thing. We find our identity, or we suppose what our identity is, and then we act in accordance with what we believe we are. 
Saul is persecutor of the Jesus followers, and this was consistent with his identity. He knew where he was, and he acted consistently with it. Look again at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. It says that Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. That is an extremely descriptive sentence in the original language. His inhale and his exhale was murder and threats against the followers of Jesus. He was completely consumed by the elimination of this movement. And so he goes to the high priest and he asks for a letter of commendation so that he can go to a synagogue in Damascus. A synagogue, of course, is a gathering of Jewish people where they would come and study the law. Damascus is not in Israel, in Palestine. It's in Syria. It's up to the north. It's above the Sea of Galilee. This is why the Christians are beginning to move all over the world. Remember, there's a persecution that started in Jerusalem by Saul at the stoning of Stephen. We see people moving into Samaria. We see people moving to different regions. Apparently, a group have moved on up into the region known as Damascus. And Saul says, I'm not content to be here in Jerusalem and have eliminated this movement. I want to eliminate this movement from the face of the earth. Can I please go to Damascus and bring them back? so that we can have a trial for them for the heresy and the blasphemy that I think they are speaking. This was consuming his thoughts. He was living out his identity clearly. He wanted to find any that were belonging to the way, men or women, so that he could bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so he went on his way, and as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light fell from heaven, and it shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. Here is where the identity crisis begins. I thought I knew who I was. I thought I knew who God was. And now on this road, as I am going to do what I think is the work of God, I am acting out the law as I think it should be acted out. I'm doing what I'm meant to do. And now I'm being stopped. And I'm not just being stopped by a group of people. I'm being stopped by a light and a voice and a resurrected Savior who is coming to me and saying, Saul, what are you doing? This is jarring to him. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that. Notice how personally Jesus takes the persecution of the church. He doesn't say, why are you persecuting those people? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting that group up in in Damascus? Why do you care? He's not saying, why are you concerned about uh, about a, a group of people that you've never met? He says, why are you persecuting me? Later he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You see, Jesus does not see the church as an it, as a thing, as a building, He doesn't see the church even as a group of people, disconnected however they are gathered together. He sees the church as part of himself. Why are you persecuting me? The church is an extension of Jesus, and he has so united himself to the church that he sees them as one and the same. What you do to those people, you are doing to me. If this is true of Jesus that he sees himself intricately united to his people, the church, then shouldn't we see it the same way? Shouldn't we see this gathering that we have here as a gathering of Jesus' followers who gather to honor the name of Jesus? We are not here as disparate people. We are here under the banner of what Jesus has done for us. 
He has brought us together. In fact, throughout the scriptures, Jesus knows his identity as well. He identifies as a son of God. He identifies as the husband of a bride, and his bride is the church. And he sees himself uniquely tied to that relationship. If some of you were to come to me and say, Pastor Jeff, we'd, we'd love to take you uh, out to dinner, but could you not bring Heather? She's a little embarrassing and awkward. <laughs> we just would rather avoid that if possible. Uh, you and I would have a problem because she and I go together. And where I go, she goes. And where she goes, I go. That's the promise that we made to one another. So for you to say, can I have some of you but not some of her, that doesn't work. Amen. In the same way, we can't say, I want some of Jesus, but I don't want his church. That doesn't work. That does not work in the economy of God. And brothers and sisters, over the last year or two, we have been tested in this to determine, do we really hold to his church? Yeah, we love Jesus, but his, his church is a little bit embarrassing sometimes. You ever heard people say that? I love Jesus, but not the church. Oh, I mean, I hear that all the time. Oh, I, I, yeah, I love God, yes. But I don't really want to associate with those people because they're strange. In fact, I think that the way that they live and act probably embarrasses God, so... You know what? That's probably true. The way that we live and act probably does embarrass God. The way that you live and act personally probably embarrasses God. And yet God loved us so much that he came and bought us and redeemed us. Read the book of Hosea. It's a beautiful story of God's redeeming love. Read the story. God's desire is to bring us into relationship with him. Why are you persecuting me, Jesus says, and this messes Paul's mind all up. Who is this voice? Who is this one that I see? Why can I see him and the other people around me can't? Why can they hear his voice? Why is this bright, bright light happening? Why can't I see anymore? What is happening to me? My identity is getting scrambled in this moment. Notice what happens in verses 7 through 9. It says this, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and he never, neither ate nor drank. Saul's identity is completely being deconstructed by Jesus. You've heard this term, deconstruction? Deconstruction is this idea of taking apart the way that I think about something. Deconstruction can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. What Jesus is doing to Paul is really important because Saul saw himself as mighty and here he is kneeling before God. Saul saw himself as the one who thought he knew other people so clearly and now he's being led by the hand because he's physically blind. Saul, the one who seized people and put them in prison, has now been seized by the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul, the hammer that came down on people's backs to break them of their thinking, has now been broken on the anvil of Christ himself. Saul's entire paradigm is being disrupted by what Jesus is doing in this moment. One of my favorite books of C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, maybe it's not my favorite book, but my favorite opening line comes in this story, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Do you know the opening line of this book? It's fantastic. It goes like this, there was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. That's a great opening line. That's a great opening line. There was a boy, his name was Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. In this story, Eustace is a problem. He's got an attitude. He's whiny. 
He's arrogant. We read in the story that he is the only child of very up-to-date and advanced people who send their son off to a progressive mixed school. And of course, Eustace, along with his cousins, get caught up into this enchanted land called Narnia. And in the course of the book, Eustace develops this very evil heart and is transformed in the story into a dragon. And at first he enjoys that, and in time he finds himself to be miserable. And he wants to escape being a dragon, but he doesn't know how to get the scales off. And so the Christ character of the story, the lion named Aslan, comes to him representing Jesus and leads him to a pure fountain, a bath to bathe in, pure water. And here's how Eustace describes the experience in the voyage of the Don Treader. This is Eustace's voice. The water was as clear as anything, and I thought that if I could get in there and bathe, it would ease the pain. But the lion Aslan told me that I must undress first. So I started scratching myself, and my scales began coming off all over the place, and so I scratched a little bit deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully, and in a minute or two, I stepped out of it, and I could see it lying there beside me, looking rather nasty. It was a most lovely feeling, and so I started to go down into the water for my bath. But just as I was getting there to put my feet into the water, I looked down and saw that the skin on my feet was hard and rough and wrinkled and scaly just as much as it had been before. And so in the story, Eustace repeats the process and starts scratching and takes off the scales and steps out of the skin and he thinks he's clean and so he goes down to the water and he goes a step in the same thing two, three times. And he realizes that he's dejected and he's frustrated. And so the lion says to him, Eustace, you will need to let me undress you. Eustace says, I was afraid of those claws. I could tell you that, but I was really desperate at this point. And so I just lay down on my back and I let him do it. The first tear that he made was so deep, I thought he had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was the pleasure of feeling the stuff come off. Well, he peeled that beastly stuff right off, just as I thought that I'd done myself the other three times, only... They hadn't hurt, and there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And then he caught hold of me. And I didn't like that very much, for I was really tender underneath now that I had no skin on. And he threw me into the water. Oh, it smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And soon I was swimming and splashing, and I found that the pain was gone. And then I saw why I had turned into a boy again. Some scholars believe that the character of Eustace is analogous to the person of Paul. One who was proud one who had a heritage that he was proud of, one who was confident in who he was, and one who sought to take care of his own problem by himself, only to find himself more and more miserable. In fact, if you read the rest of the book of Acts in Acts chapter 22, and then again in Acts chapter 26, you will see Paul giving his testimony. And one of the things that he says is that the Lord came to him and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And in Acts 26, it's added this line, why are you kicking against the goads? That's a weird word. Not the goats, the goads, G-O-A-D-S. What is a goad? A goad is a a a stick with a point on it that a farmer would use to jab an ox to keep it moving in the right direction. You've heard the term, why are you goading him on? 
This is where this comes from. Why are you kicking against the goats? I'm moving you in a particular direction, and you're like a stubborn animal who's kicking against me. What is the problem? And what were the goads that Paul was kicking against except watching Stephen die? This had to haunt him. Why is this man so content to die? Why is he not fighting back? Why is he looking into heaven? What does he see that I can't? You have to imagine that in all of the experiences that Saul had in rounding up people, in persecuting the early church, the way that the church responded to his persecution had to haunt him. It had to. Because the people who have been transformed by Jesus Christ interact with the world in a way that does not make sense to the world. That was true 2,000 years ago. That should be true today. When the world interacts with the people who have been transformed by the risen Savior, they should say, whoa, there is something different about those people. They love like I've never seen. They are willing to endure suffering for a cause like I do not understand. There is something different about them. And so here we see Paul coming to the end of himself, taken by Ananias to a house in Damascus. And look what it says in verse 17. Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on Paul, he said, brother, or Saul, excuse me, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately the scales fell off. This is Lewis's illustration with Eustace. The scales fell off. Jesus was removing the scales and he regained his sight. And his response was to get up and go get baptized. We look at that last week, right, Sam? This, this, this brother who, who comes to understand what is keeping me. There's water right over there. Let's go do this. I believe this, this response, Jesus has transformed me. What is keeping me out of the water? I believe. Let's go to the water. I need to be baptized. Not because that water is going to regenerate me, but that water is going to identify me with what Jesus has done in me that you cannot see. I am a different person because the Holy Spirit has come upon me. I want everybody to know I identify with Jesus. Amen? In two weeks, we will baptize people here. We will baptize people who recognize that their life is different because of Jesus. They will give testimony to the fact that Jesus is transforming their life. He may have begun that process decades ago. He may have begun that process this morning. But Jesus is transforming lives. And this is what Paul is experiencing in this moment. There's a process where our sin nature needs to be taken off. Paul later goes on to use the language of taking off the old self with its practices and putting on the new self, which is being renewed day by day in the image of its creator. God is taking off the old you. It's painful. But listen, it's not punishment. God taking off the old you is painful, but it's not punishment. It's not because God hates you. It's because he loves you. In fact, the way we see it, say it may be like this. God is not trying to pay you back for your evil deeds. He's trying to bring you back from them. That's the process of redemption. He's not mad at you. He's not trying to hurt you. He doesn't want to lay a heavy burden on you. The process of taking off the old self is painful, not because God is desiring to pay you back, but rather because he wants to bring you back. It's not retribution for him. It is restoration. 
and redemption. It is beautiful. Aslan gives to Eustace a renewed identity. Jesus gives to Saul a renewed identity. And so from this point on, whenever Paul has the opportunity to speak of who he is, he no longer says, I'm a law-abiding Jewish Pharisee who's a student of Gamaliel. That's not his identity anymore. That doesn't matter as much to him anymore. Rather, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. He doesn't say any longer that he is a Jew. Rather, he says, I, if you have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, Paul's identity changes, and he articulates it in Philippians chapter 3, where he says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from whom we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My identity is with Jesus now. I'm no longer a a Pharisee. I'm no longer a Jewish person. I don't want to be known as that. I want to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Galatians 5, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. So stand firm, therefore, and don't wear that yoke of slavery any longer. Your old identity is meant to weigh you down. Your old identity is meant to keep you in chains. Your old identity is something that you hold on to, thinking it will provide satisfaction and meaning in your life, but the reality is the only identity that matters is that you were bought by Jesus Christ that you are his, that he owns you, that he loves you, that he desires to have a relationship with you, that he's calling you to himself. When Paul's identity is called into question in Galatians chapter 2, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ living in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me who gave himself up for me. My identity is in Christ. And what happens when a person is converted by Jesus is that their old identity no longer is their dominant identity. Rather, they are a follower of Jesus Christ. And praise God for the way in which he has worked in so many of you through the years, calling you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Praise God. You are a changed person. You are a redeemed person. You are a person with purpose today. You are not called to live under the shame of your past. You're called to be free. You don't need to identify by the the, the, the nomenclature of this world. That is not who you are. You are a blood-bought child of God. And he desires for you to experience the greatest freedom that you will ever enjoy. So let us not be a people who identify according to the labels of this world. But let's be a people who are transformed by Jesus. Let's be a people who love in this community like no other. Let's be a people who care for one another like no other, who are gracious to one another, who are slow to create labels. Sometimes the labels come most quickly and loudly in the church. Let's not be label makers. Rather, let's say, I'm a broken person who's been bought by Jesus. Take me as I am. Deal with it. My primary identity is Jesus. And yes, along with Jesus comes all of my baggage. But he has dealt with that. I don't wear that anymore. I'm no longer a slave to that fear. I'm now a child of God. My chains are gone, we sing. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Amazing love. Amazing grace. Verse 20. 
Immediately. How soon? After years of training? Four Sunday school classes? Equip 101, 102, 103, 104? Immediately. He proclaimed Jesus to the people that he was trying to kill. It doesn't read that way. It reads that he went to the synagogues and we missed the point. That's where he was going to grab people, to take them in prison. But he goes there not to say, you come with me and you can be sure when he walked in, people were freaking out. He goes there not to say, those of you that are identifying with Jesus, you need to come with me, I'm taking you to prison. Rather, he goes there and he says, those of you that are identifying with Jesus, you're right. He is the Son of God. He is our Messiah. What I have been doing is wrong, and you Jewish people who have not yet acknowledged Jesus, please come, let me show you how much this Savior loves you. Proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he's the Son of God, and all who heard him were amazed. And they said, isn't this the guy who made havoc in Jerusalem of all those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for the same purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength. And he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving to them that Jesus was the Christ. Amen? Amen. May we be a people who are so aware of our transformation that the natural expression of our mouth is, I have been changed by Jesus. Please give me an opportunity to tell you about what God has done for me. And as we close our time this morning, we come to a place that allows us on a weekly opportunity to identify again with Jesus. So let me pray as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper this morning. Father in heaven, how we praise you and thank you for the work that you have done through your son Jesus, how you confronted this Pharisee, this Jewish law-abiding man named Saul, and you confounded him with your grace. You overwhelmed him with mercy. You demonstrated to him that the path that he was on was leading to destruction and that the only way to move towards life is through the resurrected Savior, through Jesus. Father, thank you for sending your son to Saul to change him. And more personally, thank you for sending your son to me to change me. Thank you for sending your son to everybody in this room who identifies as a follower of Jesus Christ, for that is our primary and most important identifier, that we are in Christ. And so, Father, for those maybe who do not yet know what it means to follow you by faith, I pray that the eyes of their heart would begin to open up, that they would allow the the Holy Spirit work of removing the old self, that they would follow in obedience to the clean waters of baptism that you have for us to renew in us what you have begun in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At Redwood Chapel, we care about discipleship. A discipleship is simply the process of learning to become more and more like Jesus, learning to be transformed into Jesus' image. And so we want to be a church that is focused on discipleship, a disciple-making church. And we see in Scripture that that happens best in the context of a relationship, that you have to be walking with other people for that to take place. And so all of our services and all of our small groups and everything that we are doing is done with the goal of creating relational environments for people to learn to follow Jesus.
And if you want to know more about how to do that, we'd love to point you in that direction. Some of you have attended Redwood Chapel, and that's great, but you've not yet found yourself into the fabric of Redwood Chapel. And we'd love to help you make that next step into a relational environment whereby you can grow as a follower of Jesus. If you'd be interested in doing that, uh, I'd encourage you to come to the front and find one of our staff members or go to the information booth or go to a table out in the lobby and we will have people around that can help point you in that direction. You can always contact our church office, but the Christian life is not meant to be lived by yourself. And unfortunately, our Sometimes our church environment is such that you can come and go alone, and, and that's not the way that that's meant to work. And so we want to invite you into relationship with us. Would you stand with me as we're dismissed this morning? If you're finding yourself as a guest of Redwood Chapel or you're new here or I haven't had a chance to meet you, any of those categories fit, I'd love to meet you. So uh, I'll be up here at the front. Please come down and just say hi and love to have an opportunity to greet you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance among you and give you his peace. God bless you. Have a great day.